make sure that makes sense. All right, again, uh, welcome to the uh, California High Speed Trail Authorities uh, Board Finance and Audit Committee meeting. Uh, we'll begin uh, today's meeting with uh, public comment. Did something good happen? Or? <laughs> we turned you out. Okay. First, if we would uh, record for uh, committee members here today, we're also joined by the uh, uh, board chair, Lenny McCown. Good morning. My name is Brett Rowan. I'm a civil engineer and senior project manager for Hayward Baker, uh, one of the major subcontractors we have on the high speed rail project. We're working currently on CP23 and CP4. Uh, I'm here to just express to the board uh, some major concerns we have with the contractors and the payments that are flowing down to subcontractors. I know we're not the only subcontract that's being impacted. Um, but I'm here to ask if, if there's a way to get more transparency from the authority on what has been paid to the contractors and to ask for, I guess, in essence, some downward pressure that you guys might be able to apply to the contractors to get subcontractors paid quickly and accurately and fairly. That is not currently happening. And my company is prepared to file a stop notice here by the end of the year on CP4, we're in arrears approximately five or six million dollars on progress payments and change order work that's not been paid. The contractor's been paid this work. Contractor's been paid change orders that were rightfully due some monies under, and that is not flowing down. And uh, we just need some help. Um, so I'm 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 here to throw that out there for the board to see what can happen. We're going to try to attend these meetings on a monthly basis as well. So we can try to track if that's uh, if that's improving, and I'll let you know if it does. But right now, we're it's it's a world of hurt out there for subcontractors trying to do business on the high speed rail projects. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming here, and it's something that we will look into and start that uh, comment that I'll make in a moment. Thanks. Um, We've not heard this for some period of time. At least I haven't. Uh, we certainly have been involved in the past, and I think effectively so. I appreciate your coming here, and, and we will apply whatever pressure that Thanks you Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Okay. Would you mind just stating, a, a, it's a matter of public record, but what, what's the size of your contract? Uh, we're, uh, it's roughly $20 million on each. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, that certainly changes with change orders and things like that. We're okay. $19 million or so on CP4, and I think about the same for okay. CP23. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Yep. Um, just to follow up, if I could ask uh, Joe if you would look into this and uh, please utilize uh, Brian Annis in any way you can, or let him utilize you. But if we can, if we could get uh, a response to this uh, for our next FNA meeting, unless you have it in advance, and I'd appreciate it if you would uh, provide the information to the committee members and also to the board chair. Aye, sir. Okay. Thank you. Our second comment uh, is from uh, David Schweigel. Good morning, Mr. Schweigel. Good morning. Greetings, f &A Committee. David Schweigel with Apex Civil Engineering. First off, I want to commend Hayward Baker for their excellent job on the SR65 I-80 interchange. Before I moved to Clovis, I actually lived in Rockland, and that interchange has been very much in need of upgrading for a long time. And that's going to be one of the stars of our show at the ASCE California Region Infrastructure Symposium Friday, April 3rd, 2020 at the Hilton Art and West, where the theme is driving the economy forward with infrastructure. Second, I want to give you folks a heads up on an idea that Patty Preston and I are going to be pitching to the staff of the authority on how we can get CP23 done 
up and running by the end of 2020. The idea is staff augmentation, and this will address the pain points of small businesses basically being able to steer the jet ski much faster than a large business is able to steer the Titanic, as well as address the long time it takes to staff up at the state level. So specifically, I've noticed that Precision Civil Engineering delivered more in $1 million on Merced to Sacramento than their predecessor in $7.5 million. But that's basically because the small businesses have an extraordinary ability to be very lean, very efficient. So what this idea would entail is staff augmentation, like what we're currently doing with the County of Fresno. I'm basically a traffic engineer two to three days a week. We would essentially have a small business staff uh, go to Selma Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday during the week. Uh, this will entail them providing a manual of operations, um, making sure they do everything they can and filling their role so that this project can be completed by 2020, and finally, a best practices manual once everything is done. We get this up and running by 2020. We're gonna be in great position to get down to Los Angeles well in advance of the Olympics in 2028. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Schweigel. That uh, concludes our public comment today. We can move to our agenda items. Item number one is to consider the approval of the November 19th uh, Finance and Audit Committee minutes. So moved. Second. Motion by uh, Director Camacho, a second by Director Miller. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passed unanimously. Thank you. Item number two, uh, just uh, quick remarks. Um, I'll just give you a brief update on where we are on the uh, KPMG-led uh, study, for, which is a business case study on B Bakersfield Merced. Um, we have received, uh, or KPMG has received uh, some of the ridership uh, projections and forecasts. Uh, it is waiting on further uh, forecasts. Uh, and the hope will be that uh, we'll have something to report out in January. Um, beyond that, uh, the report I think is going well. I think the information will be very helpful to the board, uh, management, and the public. With that uh, in mind, we'll move on to our third item on the agenda, which is the executive summary from the Chief Financial Officer, uh, Brian. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, I'm going to uh, brief off the executive summary for finance, which is uh, tab three of the binder. So the uh, Executive summary, as always, starts with the accounts payable aging report, which uh, was a problem in the past, but we've had a good recent record. Again, uh, for this past reporting month of October, the authority did not have an aged invoice, so all undisputed invoices were paid according to the state's prompt payment act, generally within 45 days. Uh, total disputes as well uh, fell quite a bit. Uh, total disputes in October uh, were 20, or excuse me, $2.0 million, uh, which is a decrease of $1.1 million from the prior month. And just as background, the, the highest uh, month of uh, disputes uh, was uh, $27.5 million in September of 2018. So that number in the past has been high and, and work uh, both on prompt payments and resolving disputes from uh, the staff in the finance office and also the project delivery team and contract managers has been good and they've stayed on top of that. Uh, moving on to uh, cash management, which is uh, the bottom of page two. Uh, as reported, I believe last month, uh, the treasurer did sell additional uh, Proposition uh, 1A bonds at the October bond sale. A total of uh, 375 million in bonds were sold. Our balance of uh, Prop 1A at the end of October, uh, including that bond sale, was 832 million. Uh, going on next to cap and trade, uh, the current balance of uh, cap and trade uh, proceeds for the authority is $2.3 billion. Uh, that number, at the end of October, does not include the November bond sale, 
or excuse me, the November cap and trade auction, uh, which uh, for the authority is estimated to uh, produce $184.7 million. Uh, we wait for uh, ARB about a month after the auctions, they post the final results that account for exchange rates uh, with uh, Quebec for their sales and other adjustments. But uh, we usually the uh, final number is fairly close to the, uh, the initial estimate. Are there any questions for Mr. Annis on page two? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Sure. Uh, the I would only say, I mean, you, it may not seem like a lot, but it is. I mean, it's uh, the the reduction in the dispute summary is is superb and uh, reflects on. I know a lot of hard work on those people managing the contracts and you in finance. So thank you very much. Sure. I was also wondering. I guess there's really no trend on looking back the last four the last four uh, auctions of cap and trade, I mean, it's down slightly, like a li little less than 4%, but relative to what we have utilized in our budgeting, and we're still substantially higher than that in terms of what we're generating quarterly. That's that's correct, yeah. I think including the November auction, the last four for high-speed rail have netted about $730 million, mm -hmm. and the conservative number we often use is a $500 million a year estimate. So. Um, they, they certainly have been fairly, uh, relatively stable since the uh, extension of the cap and trade that was done a few years ago. Uh, so continuing to look strong. Um, okay. I'll go on next to page three of the agenda, the administrative budget and expenditures report. Uh, through October, that's 33% uh, of the fiscal year completed. And uh, we've spent 21.6% uh, or 12.1 million of our total administrative budget for the fiscal year. Uh, the vacancy rate as of October 31st was 26.2%. Uh, uh, that is 71 vacancies out of the uh, 271 authorized positions. Um, we, of course, uh, are, uh, started the year behind uh, because we have uh, added 45 positions into this budget. Um, the, uh, I, I did uh, get the, uh, a more current statistic of vacancies as of December 6th, and uh, I drilled down in this one a bit. Uh, as of December 6th, we're showing the same number of vacancies as we showed at the end of October. Um, so uh, while that, that overall number shows uh, no progress, I wanted to report within that, uh, the authority did fill eight positions. Uh, two of them were filled with uh, retired annuitants in, into temporary positions, so we don't count those. Um, we had uh, additionally uh, uh, six positions or new hires that came onto the authority during this period but we had six separations uh, from the authority, so we're at a, a net of zero over this five-week period uh, of November and the first week of December. Uh, we do, however, have, I uh, believe, uh, 41 positions uh, that are uh, in the hiring process right now with some extended job offers, some uh, notice positions that are undergoing interviews, et cetera. So I'm going to move on to the next slide, uh, slide uh, four, uh, the capital outlay budget summary. Uh, the number for October uh, was tracking the preliminary number that we, we provided at the last F&A meeting, uh, monthly expenditures for capital outlay uh, totaled $88.6 million. Uh, this slide it gives you a bit of detail. Uh, the uh, uh, fourth bullet here in the middle of the page indicates monthly expenditures for design-build contract work within each construction package. Uh, CP1 was 9.3 million, CP23 was 24.8 million, and CP4 was 14.2 million for a total of 48.3 million dollars. Uh, I share a couple of the categories to, to uh, get up to the total. Um, the uh, PCM project contract manager expenditures were $4.3 million. Right-of-way purchases were $14.7 million. And we also had spending 
on what we uh, call the bookends, uh, the uh, uh, Caltrain electrification, the Rosecrans Marquardt, uh, the San Mateo grade separation, and uh, those, uh, uh, those expenditures, I believe, totaled $10 million. Um, I, Any questions for Mr. Annis on, on slide four? Yes. The expenditures that you're showing on, um, on the projects, um, specifically the construction packages, CP1, 2, two 3, and 4, those totals include the delay? Those are not construction dollars. Uh, these are uh, primarily construction dollars. I'd have to check and get back to you if they included any smaller settlements. Uh, we don't okay, have, I don't so believe, in our time settlements in these particular numbers. As an example, 2-3, uh, CP 2-3, you're suggesting that they did $29.6 in construction, when in fact that's probably <clears throat> much less if you extract the... Um, the delay, uh, the delay claim that you paid out, is that correct, well, no, Joe? No, is that right, no, no, or is that, or these actual dollars? I'll brief the actual construction numbers, but that is actual construction. Invoice this month, total invoice this month is nearly forty-six. Million. I can barely hear you, Joe. I'm sorry. You're stealing from my thunder, Ernie. I know. <laughs> this month, it's the invoicing for the CPs is approximately 46 million total, right? Next month, this is for work completed. That's what you're talking about, IR oh, for not, not these, the TIAs. Next month, it's going to be another 46 is my projection with a 133 for CP233 for that TIA. Thank you, Joe. So it is actual construction, these dollars. Yes. What I just quoted was the 46 are actually, those are, those are invoice AR. These are what the major, major three contractors on the joint ventures that they built us and invoiced us, invoiced us for. So approximately 46 for this month and it'll be projecting for another 46 next month. Thank you. Uh, one last question, right? Going back a little bit, and Joe, this might involve you. The the uh, contractual relationships that we have are with the primes, with the with the authority. Uh, the gentleman that spoke earlier about a delayed invoice. Um, I, I I know we're not supposed to respond to those necessarily those questions, but is there a bundling problem with with some of the invoices? I know this is not unique to, or this is. Uh, a problem that construction industry has had if in fact you have a prime and you have invoice you have several subs and one sub may be delayed in submitting an invoice so we hold up the entire invoice and is that part of the problem that we're having no i don't think so ernie i i think i have to go back each one of these is very unique that as you as you indicated, our privity is that with the joint ventures. We do have responsibility to ensure prompt payment to the small businesses. We have a special unit that that's what they oversight and overview. So I need to go back, check each of these invoices for, and then go back into the subcontracts and go back, pull the string individually one, one time. I don't think there's a general... Um, delinquency overall, I just have to go back to the individual contractors and subcontractors and see what the issues are. But this is not unique to, this problem is not unique to just small minority businesses, but I think it's it's unique. I mean, it, it, it falls under the category. Of, I mean, many of those subs are, could be a large business or a medium-sized business, but still are, cash flow is cash flow. And when you look at a $20 million contract, that's it's just a lot of cash flow. It, you're absolutely right. And running small businesses and having to subtract out of my kids' college funds to make payroll, I understand that. We want to make sure, though, that the concept of paid is paid is adhered to, and that if the contractors are paid, the, the primes are paid for work, that that money does promptly flow down into the subcontractors. But again, is you might have two or three tiers of these large contracts. You might have two or three tiers of subcontracting 
as into pushing down. So I have to go back and check to see what tier we're at and then push, make sure those invoices are getting pushed all the way down. Thank you. I will also note on, on the question that later in this report, we talk about our uh, use of contingency and that uh, includes one of the time impact uh, items uh, for uh, CP23. And so that's not reported in this October month. Uh, it'll likely uh, be reported in the November period at, at next month's meeting. And we'll, uh, we'll make a note of that so you're uh, clear on what uh, time delay is, uh, what, uh, what component of the uh, capital expenditure that is. Brian, just finally on, on this uh, slide four, if we look at the, the budget at the top line at uh, 2.255 billion for this fiscal year, that would require a spend rate at about 188 million a month. And through the first quarter or third of this year, we're about 44% less than that. The only way that I think that we can look at what's, what's inside the budget that we're running maybe more, more behind on than others would be to looking at the budget. Is there, at least I can't think of any other schedule in here is it a possibility that we can just, I don't want you to create a bunch of more work, yeah. but if we had a better idea of what are we lagging on, yeah. uh, the major items we're lagging on. And so if we had just something that was, if, if you happen to, if you're looking right. at it and you think there are five major things that come out at you, if you could report that out to us, that would be, that would be helpful. Uh, the concern is that the budget is put in at 2.255, the expectation, of the committee and the board would be that it's that we would be on on track to spend that over the over the budget year and um, we would appear to have big challenges and we're th we were third into this at the end of October. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, we do have some a a aggregate information on uh, tab seven, uh, page one of nine. There's a sort of a running chart yeah. of expenditures for the fiscal year. Uh, but understand you may be looking for a, a drill down a bit on that on that detail on what specifically we're running behind on. We'll take a look at that more carefully then. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, I'll move on to the bottom of page four, which is the uh, uh, under the title total project expenditures with forecast. Uh, uh, the chart on the left uh, shows the uh, total spending on the program to date, uh, about $6.1 billion. And the chart on the bottom right is indicating our achievement of the match for the federal ARA funds. Um, the biggest category we're tracking right now uh, on the total uh, uh, second column from the right is $780 million, and that's uh, invoices that are... Uh, have been sent to uh, the Federal Railroad Administration uh, for approval. Uh, they have not uh, acted on any in about a, a year. So uh, the average time we've had uh, the invoice information sitting at the FRA for approval is about 213 days currently uh, for that category. Um, if you include uh, that category, uh, what has been approved in the past by FRA, uh, and what we have in-house we're working on to submit to the FRA, uh, we're approaching 70% uh, of the R match requirement. So I'll move on here to uh, page five. Uh, this is the contract and expenditure report. The authority as of October had 201 active contracts uh, at just over seven billion in value. Uh, small business rate was 21.4%, uh, which uh, is a number that uh, is remaining relatively constant. Uh, uh, the prior month was 21.6%, and the prior year was 21.2%. Uh, uh, finally, uh, the last page on the executive summary is the use of contingency. In the baseline adopted in May, uh, the total contingency was $3.6 billion. Um, 
total uh, authorized for use of that is 670 million, uh, leaving uh, 2.9 billion of remaining contingency that hasn't been uh, directed for use at this time. Uh, the charts in the middle uh, describe some of the activity in October as uh, uh, I believe the day before our last F&A meeting and board meeting, uh, the uh, time impact uh, settlement for CP23 was, was announced to the board last month, but that was, uh, wasn't able to get into the, the reporting package, so it's displayed here. Of that 134 million, 108 of that was related to uh, time impacts, and the remainder was a variety of other settlements that were included in that, in that package. Uh, this also indicates a settlement, uh, or excuse me, a uh, use of contingency of six million on, on the uh, chart on the middle right, and this was for the uh, Bakersfield Homeless Center. Uh, the authority reached agreement for an early uh, land purchase where, where the current Bakersfield Homeless Center is, and having this certainty allows the Homeless Center and the city to work to uh, find an upgraded facility and get an early start on that so there's no uh, disruption to uh, uh, homeless individuals in Bakersfield. That uh, concludes the update. Thank you, Mr. Annis. Any uh, further questions of Mr. Annis? Okay, thank you. Move on now to the next item on our agenda, uh, Mr. Hedges. This will be the uh, Central Valley update. Good morning. Um, I'd like to, if we just brief the R, which is tab 10, which is known as the Central Valley update. Uh, you guys jump in slides, please. Oh, there you go. Slide number two, you can see currently that the current expenditures is just over um, $2 billion. Um, we've had a very strong month, as I just previously reported and that we had a $46 million um, cumulative invoices through CP1 through um, CP4. So very good, strong growth. You can see that we're pretty much on our the projection line with regards to completing for our uh, If you advance to slide the next page, which is slide three, you can see that we are about $6 million over our projection of 40 with a 46. Next month, which is important to also see is that we're projecting about a 46 plus the 133. The 133 is for a time impact um, claim with regards to CP23. So total there will be about 180 in the month of November. December, as you would expect, will be a slight decline with regards to two aspects. That is the inclement weather that we're currently suffering. And two is that this is also the drawdown period with regards to the railroads. They prohibit their construction on or about their railroads during the holiday season as they are predominantly moving a lot of Christmas goods. Joe, I'd like to go back if we can to uh, page two. Or slide two. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. I just want to make sure that the, the, you concur with just roughly this sort of an assessment of it. Um, so we've got roughly 33 months based on your schedule to uh, increase the, what we have already spent at two point, roughly 2.1 up to 3.863 or 8.64. Yes, sir. That's currently so, what's under contract. Right, under contract on CP1 through 4. And so that would, that would require over the 33 months about 50, just in round numbers, about 54 million a month. Yes, sir. I'd like to, would, I'd like to be able to, to drive and push to increase this part of the, 
increase the slope, the rate here, mm -hmm. um, as in to get a little bit more flatter on top to give us a little bit more leadway. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing, as, as we have spoke before, is we're underway right now. We've been working with the contractors now for months, and they've been very receptive um, to rebaselining their schedules to look to ensure that we can meet this. We also have matched. We're in the process right now of matching our the remaining right-of-way delivery to be able to meet those baseline schedules. With regards to the state, the highest risk right now, I would say for us, is the achievement of the right-of-way and land conveyance schedule. And we're, we're convening summit, what I call right-of-way summits. I have a right-of-way summit with two, three, which is a joint summit, as in to make sure that we have the optimum dates to be able to achieve that curve. So um, it would seem to me that the one thing that ought to be considered to be added to your chart here, uh, and um, we've uh, we've you know had the, the CEO talking about this before, um, but with regards to track and systems, everything that I think that we're looking at on this schedule is what you are are primarily focused on right now with ensuring that we comply with the R grant. Yes, sir. So what's missing here is at least a portion of CP5 uh, having to do with just at least those items uh, that we're contemplating in a track and system contract. The, the, just those items, items on notice to proceed one that are required under the R grant. And that should be added to the top of your schedule here, I think. <laughs> Yes, sir, we can we can achieve that and add that spend into that. But I can also expand this this report, basically. What we have is a strategy with regards to what we call, it's a minimum of five mile segments, right? The concept right now, if you read the track and systems, is to turn over increments of approximately five miles or greater segments to allow the track and systems contract to come in and increment and to lay track. It is not the optimum way with regards to either starting at the south and working towards the north or going from the north to the south. Mm -hmm. But because we are up against ARA, we're going to have to use a little bit of creativity. And that might also include in, in this schedule here in that last year, we've allowed basically 21 into 22 as into the completion of that guideway, which is the, the guideway and the type one structures, what carries our our high-speed rail. There might be some ongoing type two work, which is traffic over the um, guideway ongoing during that period. So we're looking very creatively, looking at ways um, to avoid sp spending money for acceleration that we do not need to spend. Well, you, you've alluded to it, and I appreciate it. Um, I think one of the things that could be helpful uh, to members of the committee and, and later the board and perhaps just in one presentation, but would be, and maybe maybe that'll occur sooner than later, um, an, an understanding of exactly what occurs in the construction of the track and systems um, in terms of um, linear, linearly uh, what goes first, what can overlay, uh, and that sort of thing so that we understand that and understand the implications of the obligation with under the R grant and ensuring that we complete at least that portion of the work under track and systems not later than the completion of CP1 1 through 4 with 5 added to it at least with that that uh, portion of it um understood sir we can we can lay that out okay. and with regards to the context of hopefully what will be the approved rfp today okay so it'll, you know it's easily done it's all in the, it's all in that document okay that'll be great joe we, we've been focusing on the civil work for the r agreement um, without really thinking about the track track and systems so are we to, are you then suggesting that we will begin laying track before the civil work is done? Uh, sir, I'm gonna lay, as soon as, as we start, we're gonna, we're implying the concept now of what I call beneficial, the, the contract terms beneficial occupancy. As soon as we can get five mile segments from the contractor, we're going to take those and, as, and then basically, I'm assume these projects in increment to allow the track and system um, contractor 
the most areas to start his work. The sooner, the better. The sooner we can get work done, the better off we're going to be. The, the critical path right now for the track and systems, be truthful with you, is, is that we must move to the RFP because we, ne we need to get the design. There is, a, there's an, again, it's, it's the S curve. There is this design and material procurement, right, that is going to drive the being able to put that track down. We have to be very conscious of that. It just isn't turning over the CPs. It's also allowing that contractor the ability to complete their design and to procure their material. They have some long lead items, especially with regards to the rail and, and the mill runs that have to occur. The, who assumes, and maybe this is a legal question, but the liability with the track on the civil work when in fact they aren't being done by the same people. Sir, so we have, again, is it is a symbiotic relationship with regards to the ability to turn over track to the tracking systems. That risk is owned by the authority. Hmm. You couldn't have, even in, if you have to think about this, is that in the concept that there was three different um, JVs associated with the construction of each of the CPs. So finding, even if we picked one of those contractors, it would still be one out of three. There'd be two short someplace. Then we're talking about perhaps laying that five mile of track. We're also talk, talking about electrification. So we're going to talk about overhead catenary systems, uh, track, uh, while civil work is going on. No, sir. We're going to put in the backbone infrastructure in most cases to be able to, to be able to do that and to accommodate that. But that is not a requirement of Aura. No, I agree. Right. I, it's now not that is coming. That is coming post Aura. Our plan is post Aura right now. The emphasis to to the 22 date is to achieve Aura. Well, Aura is just a basic track system. Yes, sir. Okay. As into as into get down the 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 build out of currently, which is the 15.6 baseline, which is currently what we call the test track that will come after we achieve Aura. That electrification, those things. The construction of the facilities that are associated with the maintenance of that 119 miles, that'll come post. Thank you. Go ahead and carry on, Joe. Thank you. Sir, so moving forward past, um, well, how do I get, well, oh, I'm sorry. Slide nine, um, slide 10. Here, I'm sorry. These pages are not. We're not gelling now. Somehow this got brief got out. Um, construction progress here, sir, is, is right here. This is all three CPs here. The, the final on that 103 is 119, as you're well aware of. Okay. What you're having here is, is we've had great, the, the 79 is a little bit off, but what you're seeing here, the guards to underway of guideway work, um, we've made good progress in CP23 and CP4 right now with guideway. What we're lacking, and if you study the invoice right now, strong invoices of approximately nearly 2% for CP23 and CP4, good indicators, right? What the indication though, what we're lagging right now is in CP1. CP1 is, is what we're currently struggling with in both structures and alignment. Now, the reason for that is, is, is obvious in the sense this. CP1 is the most further advanced. They've taken all the low hanging fruit, the easy structures. Right now to, to, to push CP1 forward, we are dealing with almost timeless issues that go back to, to pre-award of these contracts. We've made very good progress right now. Our relationship with UP is advanced. 
We got our final design with regards to the downtown shoe fly, which is the ability. There's three shoe flies that need to be constructed in CP1. Those are advancing. They are predecessor activities to doing guideway work because these allow the various railroads to pull their trains offline and to provide temporary storage holding facilities as to accommodate our ongoing guideway work. So very good news with UP. Um, late in coming, but I applaud um, UP's um, responsiveness to late. Being NSF, um, overall champions. Um, very strong um, proponents, advocates of our um, of the of the high speed rail, um, relatively very cooperatively. The other issues that you'll see throughout all three other CPs is with regards to the primary first order work. Again, we've spoke about this is the PG&E. Um, we are doing. We are now conveying property land grants to them. That is occurring. So. Um, not as fast as I would like, but it is happening. There seems to be no no major issues, just kind of working out some of the staff levels, some of the, the communication problems. No problems with their executives. I've met with the VPs of um, PG&E. They're very committed to this project. So, so Joe, on, on structures and guide weight, just looking at your, we, we have it as, as slide four, I think you had it as. Whatever yes, sir. Here's, here's the summary sheet of the structures and guideways. Yeah, but I mean, is it correct then to assume that, or, or to conclude that on the guideway, uh, in terms of progress, uh, uh, construction progress, we're about 16% behind and about a third behind on structures? Yes, sir. Okay, and given that then, I mean, it, it at least at this point, it could be that we'd need to see another month or two, but... It, the gap seems to be widening and not and not closing. So yes. is that something that you're going to suggest to us that we'll see a a um, a uh, mo movement towards uh, the plan and actual construction uh, completed uh, it moved together in the next uh, three or four months? Yes, sir. Uh, um, CP two three. By the start of next construction season, we should have we should have closed this gap. I don't I don't see that as being a big issue. It's predominantly in land conveyance, land right conveyance um, is is the issue. Um, CP four, um, my projection is by the start of next construction season, if we can um, work out the O and M agreements with Semitropic, which then will lead us to the real estate agreements. Semitropic is, or CP4 will be right on track. They should be almost 100% free. It'll be a very good news. Uh, CP1, as I indicated right now, there is the big driver of CP1 is, it, it, it links to two things this AT&T line, which is the major fiber optic trunk line that runs north-south for AT&T. We chose a perfect alignment that um, basically um, goes right over the top of it, right? And some of the, the most, some of the most complex structures, these are the trenches. We cannot start those trenches until we get this glass out of the way. There's no way to work around that glass. It's too fragile. The other issue as you go north is that even though it's off to the side, it is, it is in, in most cases directly below our intrusion barrier protection system. So currently right now we're working around some, trying to locate the exact location of it. And if we have to, we're going to come up with a bridge foundation system to get over it on the north. Um, create creative activities to do that. CP1 also too, with regards to some of the issues that we've had with some of the third parties, um, we're, uh, and right away, um, we've uh, initiated a bunch of redesigns right now that are going to allow us then to step around some of these utilities and to avoid um, the right-of-way conflicts. So instead of continuing on with the same inputs to get the same output of stalemated, 
Um, going to change one of the inputs. Going to do, I've initiated some redesigns. It's going to take a little bit of time up here, but overall, um, it should save, it'll get us back on track and give us certainty with regards to start. I can answer, I can go down into each of the CPs in detail if you would like to, to go down and provide, or I can provide the committee kind of an overall summary report of the major structures that we're lacking instead of, it will take literally about 30 minutes to go through the whole report detail by detail. No, we can, carry, we can move on, yeah, Joe. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is a very telltale sign here. What's good about this, it's good, it's bad. As you can see from this month to last month, the numbers have predominantly, um, they're not increasing, they're decreasing. We've been working with all of our joint adventures as in to figure out ways around of row procurement. Each of these procurements, the remaining 443 parcels will have a, through redefining every single one of the processes in right away, each one of these 443, hopefully by the beginning of the, the new year, will have a tracking system for every one of the steps. We're also initiating another policy is this, is that um, 30 days after we've made our initial um, offer, initial offer, if it needs to be, we'll include an admin settlement. If there is justification for an admin settlement, a little bit of above. If, it, if it's a parcels on critical path, to try to avoid delayed. But in this case, you'll see that on the 31st, we're working with our Caltrans legal team. We will immediately go into the condemnation process and then work the condemnation and the negotiation simultaneously. I do not, no longer want to do these two activities, draw out negotiations for months, come to the conclusion that we still have, to, we're gonna have to go to condemnation. So to me, is the best way is on the 31st day, we'll be in a position as to go before the Public Works Board and then to initiate the condemnation process. Why we still continue negotiation, optimum is negotiate our way out, but I want to get us in a position that if we do have to take condemnation, it'll be at the at the quickest possible date. I totally agree with that approach. That's a way to move it. It's a process we should have initiated that was going to be at, the, at the beginning. It should have been our general policy to be truthful with you. So, but but now I've I've taken a much more stronger hand in right away. Like I said, is I want to commend Russell Burgess and the right away staff. We've gone through it. We've used the concept of Lean Six Sigma. We've completely gone through the whole right away process, looked and evaluate every step, the necessity of every step, the risk associated with every step. Work close hand in glove with council as in to streamline these processes down. Hopefully is drive this six up here. If you look at this, the goal is I'd like to get the majority of that 443 out by this time next year. And that will it's also, it's critical too. If we, if the board decides and the governor decides to extend the alignment into the IOS, I need to have the capability um, in right away to, to continue that march because I want to avoid the situation that we're in right now of having concurrent construction and being procuring right away out there. I want to get to a configured alignment this time. Um, we know our footprint, we have our environmentals type that and our right away and start this in advance as to avoid this high risk. Okay. But I'm going to need the capacity of road to be able to do that. They're pretty impressive uh, goals, Joe. I, I assume they're there because you believe they're attainable. Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. Th these are pretty impressive goals. I, assu I assume that you've listed them because you believe they're attainable. Yes, sir. Every every night I say a little prayer. <laughs> there's there's a pl there's plans we're not, of we're attack. Not sing for you, okay? Yeah. Then. Yes, sir. There is plans. There is plans of attack for all of this. Let me be very clear to the committee. Okay, um, we're going to win this game in the fourth quarter in the last couple of minutes. Okay, 
it is going to be close. There is not a lot of leadway, all right? It is predicated upon changing some of our processes, driving and becoming very results driven, which all the elements are in place now. The last thing that we needed really to transition was and to evolve was that of right away. We've done that. So hopefully you'll see some better production numbers right up, right up here. Well, if they start slipping, I would assume that you'll let us know as soon as you know. Yes, sir. I'll be. You can see that's the that's the nice thing about these new packages. You can absolutely see that it's completely transparent. These are all the lead lag indicators. You can see. You can pick up right on it. Okay. These are the agreements here. Uh, everything's closing. Everything um, don't have any major issues. I would say we have a few irrigation districts that it's linked to this concept of this, is that it's linked to right away acquisition and to the third parties, predominantly the O&Ms. The, rightfully so, my dad being a director of an irrigation district back in the day, he wants to, they want to ensure their functionality, right, of their irrigation district before they're gonna sell you their real estate. That's their leverage over you. I'm aware of that. We're working right now, the focus is figure out their operational concerns, and then it makes for a lot easier negotiations. Hopefully we can achieve that with Semi-Tropic. If we get Semi-Tropic and CP4, that's gonna free up basically, there's 22, well, we have divided up in 22 zones, that'll free up the, the last five of the 22. Okay. Any questions with any of the third party agreements? And you can see too that none of them are major JUAs. These are what I call secondary elements to these agreements. Environmental clearances, um, another call out to, to our partners. And um, they've been just amazing. And that is with regards to, you can see, we've achieved all the major environmental clearances that have eluded us since the award of these projects. We just received the last one um, a couple of weeks ago. So it's a great news story here. Now we have some, we have some sub issues that we have to do um, right now. We have to get the next tier down of this is gonna be these master um, stream agreements and what they call um, sub notes that we need to put into these agreements, which are, make them a little bit more specific. Um, meeting with the director of CDFW for our um, monthly meeting, we're gonna talk that out and see if we can get those all back on, get those all on a schedule. So you'll see those driven by schedule also. Questions with environmental clearances? No, go ahead, Joe. Okay. Now, sir, question to to you. Do you want me to brief each of the CP1, each of the packages? Um, we I can, or you can have it for overview. I would like, though, to brief at the end of this brief, the last element of the rod nods, and that is to talk about, is to talk, the last element of R, and that's to talk about the rod nods, if you, if you don't mind. I don't know how much time you want to spend. Need it, need it more. And okay, let's let's move to the rod non. Uh, okay. Sir, I don't I don't know what what. Um, also, too, it's a, it's important to realize too the one of the big mods that I, that I referred to already, and that is the 133 mod, which is basically about 109 million for time impact, and the, the remainder of that 133 was and CP23 was for um, settlement issues. We settled, I think, 24 issues, if memory serves me right. Okay, right here, this is what you wanna be looking at. Um, we've adopted this schedule. Everything is currently on track. The next one to, to be basically to, the focus out, and that is the why. Um, L, as you know, the LGA is already signed. We're in the process right now of the various stages. If I was to point out probably the one that 
is at the biggest risk right now, and that is the LA to Anaheim. And that is driven by our cooperative arrangement with regards to BNNSF, as in to use our rod nod, as in to we adjoin that to some of their sites to clear some of their sites. There's an ongoing negotiation. We've become very aggressive with BNNSF and the local communities as in to ensure that we push that. But everything else has plenty of float and is progressing. Other great great news stories is, is in the Bakersfield to Palmdale um, is the work that staff has done with the Cesar Chavez Center. Um, they've worked hand in glove. We've created a series of visual um, visual optic um, modeling that allows basically us to prove to them that we're basically able to hide our high-speed rail from, from their view and maintain um, the serenity and the originality of the Caesar um, um, Chavez Center. Not was not for free, but um, we're able to do that and to work with them, which is important to do. I want to point out and give kudos to the staff as this, because we're solving problems in the planning stage by solving these problems when we have contracts awarded. And that's what Ernie was alluded to, is, is use your planning phase, solve these problems in advance. And then the last one of these major problems, actually there's two problems that are left in the southern alignment that we need to work with, and that is around Una Lake. We're engaged with the Army Corps right now, as in to figure out the optimum route for, there's a series, there is not a, a best route, we're just gonna have to figure out what's the optimum, the, the one of least impact. And then as you saw, working with um, the good news there, we're also working down in the Burbank area, with regards to the rod nods as we bring bring the high speed um, close to the airport, making sure that we're coordinated with regards to the intermodal um, transportation. So all relatively a pretty good news story here. A lot of work being done um, at the community level, complement the RDs for that work, station planning underway. Um, and then it kind of goes back to the question is, want to take as we advance all of this stuff as we as we move forward in our our alignments is one of the next stages is is in the 119 is to create a master plan with regards to our determining what is our excess property is going to be retaining those properties we need for o and m and for future development around our stations but the rest of this is seeing which excess starting to shed that and applying also as we move out on the right of way here, that concept. The question would become is, do we, with regards to the real property, um, there is another committee, do, do we engage that committee? And when, I know Brian will talk to you, Lenny, about that. What's, what's the optimum way to do this? Okay. When, when because, uh, do you think we'll get a, a more completed uh, um, presentation and understanding of of the whole issue with the excess properties and what we're going to do with them and what it's costing us and what they're worth and all that sort of thing. Yes, sir. What what I want to do is this is 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 take a very deliberate approach here, and that is is to make sure first of all don't excess any property that we might need with regards to the completion of the one nineteen. Number one, okay. Number two, that we look out in advance of ourselves with regards to the O&M, right? And that concept, I, I just love the work that May, I, I've given all this to our chief planner, Meg, okay? I love the work that, of, that Meg is starting to do with regards to the concepts of sustainability, right? Looking to retain some property with maybe with regards to, I think a very, very strong application of P3 is that of creating alternative energy, solar, using some of our various properties um, for for the for production of solar. I think it just fits in very well with the concept of the high speed. It also gives us a, a little bit of redundant capacity, All right? So those ideas, but I wanna plan for those. I wanna use, use those properties. I wanna earmark those properties. Then around the stations, All right? I know that, that you've just have, Tom, you've had just tremendous amounts of input and guidance and Lenny into that is that we have a lot of property, strategic property, especially in downtown Fresno, is 
I want to use those properties wisely. I want to engage your expertise as, as developers. How can, we, how can we advance that concept? Very, very important. And I've asked Meg, as our chief planner, is to start that. Again, is with you, with the communities, achieving a vision and then documenting that vision with regards to a master plan that'll clearly annotate what we want to keep, why we, and give the reason why we want to keep it, and then to statute, the rest will be annotated as excess property, and then we'll go through the pro process of disposing of it and to create an um, existing revenue as in to allow us to either offset the right away overruns that we've just occurred and to use that money forward. So it all makes sense. These are all great things that the staff is currently engaged in looking forward over the horizon. You know, with, with bringing Meg aboard as our, um, the, what I call the assistant chief operating officer with regards to sustainability and planning, just been, been a, a fabulous uplift. Okay. And that's it, sir, unless you have questions. Thank you, Joe. Any questions for uh, Mr. Hedges? Just one final thing then, Joe. Uh, last month, uh, Director Camacho uh, asked uh, that any questions that are addressed to management would be noted in the, uh, in the minutes, which I see that you've done that. What I think would, uh, just to complete it, uh, I don't want you to have to do a lengthy narrative, but would you, if you would just put the short answer to each of the questions, so you've got something that you, you're not guessing on what management's response was. Yes, yes sir. Well, actually, what we'll do is I'll include them so that the public has transparency. We'll immediately transmit those as soon as we get them. Then what we'll do is we'll just include it in this yeah. package so yeah. that the public has transparency yeah, to put, it. Make it a part of the minutes, and, and don't make it a big, long no, I don't report. It's not necessary. It, it may be occasionally, and if so, we'll, we'll make that clear to you. All right. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank and again, you. kudos to everybody who's, who's just right now in the field pushing hard. So. All right. All right. Thank you. Anything uh, from either committee members? Mr. Chairman? Okay. Uh, for those who are going to remain for the board meeting, uh, we could just give you a heads up right now that it's intended that we're going to have a closed session before we start the board meeting. So the closed session will be at uh, 10 o'clock. And with that, the uh, Finance and Audit Committee uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.